Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James H. Anise, and today we're looking at Freaky, released in 2020, but which only came out on Blu-ray last week. I promised this was the fastest I could make this video. Freaky is the latest film from Christopher Landon, the writer of four Paranormal Activity sequels, and more recently, the director of both Happy Death Day films. Happy Death Day was praised for its fun horror twist on Groundhog Day, and similarly, Freaky is a horror version of Freaky Friday, or The Hot Chick, since that is also a body swap movie, and one that specifically features a high school girl finding herself inside a grown man's body. In Freaky, Landon and co-writer Michael Kennedy successfully emulate the easy entertainment that made Happy Death Day so enjoyable. It's a good time at the movies, thanks to a whole bunch of jokes and committed performances from its two lead actors. Catherine Newton kills it as a Michael Myers-style serial killer, and Vince Vaughn deserves an award for his ability to channel a teenage girl. Freaky may not feel as tight as its spiritual predecessor, and there are some jokes that don't quite land for me, but it's still hilarious throughout and, like Happy Death Day, makes time for emotional scenes between characters that come off as genuine rather than corny. I normally don't enjoy movies that have too much of a pop sensibility to them, I always think of that god-awful montage in the Carrie remake, but it helps that Chris Landon is sincere with his filmmaking. He's not just targeting a key demo or whatever. I I only write and make movies that I truly want to see. There's also one area where Freaky kicks Happy Death Day's ass, and that's the kills. I don't think Happy Death Day necessarily suffered from its PG-13 rating, but now that I know how extreme Landon's willing to get with his gore, I hope he stays committed to traveling in the hard R lane. This thing is bloody! I honestly did not want to make a hardcore slasher film without the gore. Since I want all of us to revel in that devilish gore, I got a sponsor for today's episode so I could leave it all uncut. Manscaped is a great way to keep your body nice and groomed or even someone else's if you happen to find yourself swapped somehow. So don't worry if you wake up looking like a six foot five serial killer. You can still keep things tidy downstairs using the Lawn Mower 3.0, a cordless trimmer that's waterproof, meaning you can use it in the shower. The Lawn Mower comes as part of the Perfect Package 3.0 kit, which also includes the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. After all that tidying up, you won't even want to switch bodies back. Get the Perfect Package for 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash deadmeat. That's 20% off and free shipping to all sorts of places by going to manscaped.com slash deadmeat. Body swapping can be fun and all, but my job is body counting, so let's get to the kills. The movie begins two days before the big one, with a cold open that firmly establishes it as a horror movie. We're talking rich person mansion, a group of sloppy idiot kids, and a fire pit recital of a local urban legend, a homecoming killer called the Blissfield Butcher. Naturally, these idiot kids are horny and curious, and one of them comes across Ladola, a fancy looking dagger kept safe in a display case, though apparently after they used it to open a bag of Cheetos. This house is full of historical artifacts, present and missing, and fragile expensive bottles of wine that- Dude, I just said those were fragile and expensive. Breaking fancy wine bottles? That's a paddling. Or, if you're dealing with the Blissfield Butcher, that's a murderin'. Oh, sick! And then he breaks the bottle when it's already deep inside the throat? Fuck yeah, dude, that is gross! The Butcher moves on to his next victim, a girl named Sandra, and crushes her head all to hell with a toilet seat. Just breaks that noggin open like it were a watermelon and he was potty humor Gallagher. While their peers were dying, Evan and Ginny were finishing a sex scene. Well, Ginny was, anyway. Wait, what about me? You're taking too long. It's a vagina, not an all-night drive through Guess Evan's gonna die with blue balls, then, because the butcher sticks a broken tennis racket straight through the poor guy's head. My condolences to Mayor Zach Morris. Ginny, the last and most annoying idiot teen, is unable to save herself from the butcher as he references Friday the 13th, the final chapter. And when he finally catches her and swings her into a spear he had thrown into the wall, he also mimics Michael Myers and his classic head tilt, most famously done with the killing of Bob in the original Halloween. The butcher hears some chanting coming from Ladola, and he disappears with the dagger before Ginny's parents get home to give an OG scream scream. <laughs> <laughs> Great work, folks. Casey Becker's parents would be proud. Kick-ass cold open. 
It shows that this movie admires its predecessors and that Landon wants to have a good time with the kills. There aren't any deaths that are the same in this movie. Way to keep my job fun, Chris. It's Thursday the 12th now, an average day for the Kessler family. Mama Coral, older sister, cop Charlene, and high schooler Millie, who's got standard final girl written all over her. She's played by Catherine Newton, who's already had one hell of a career, and who met director Christopher Landon when she was 15 and starred in Paranormal Activity 4, which he wrote. The Kessler women are still reeling from the death of Papa Kessler a year ago. Millie's become real reserved, Coral's drinking like she were Nancy Thompson's mom, and Charlene? Well, Charlene's the worst fucking cop I've ever seen in a movie, you'll see. Millie lives in the picturesque town of Blissfield and has two best friends, Josh and Nyla. I love your black wiener, Mr. Daniels. Joshua. The dog is black, Nyla. Hey, Mr. Daniels there is played by Alonzo Ward, who was a technician that became shark food in Jaws 3D. Anyway, I end up liking Millie's friends later on, but I wasn't big on Josh after one of his early lines. I'm in it for the drunk straight boys who will suddenly realize they're fluid. That sounds kind of rapey. Good. Wait, what? That's not good at all. I think that was just a clumsy implementation of what they were trying to do with the character. By design, wanted a character that was openly sexual, you know, in a way that is typically and I think traditionally reserved for like horny straight teens. Clumsy or not, Josh and Nyla are the only friends that Millie has. Most everyone else in the school is a dick to her. <laughs> Yeah, like that kid. O'Doyle rules! The worst is Mean Girl Ryler, a Napoleonic trash talker who insults Millie's social standing. At least this dude Booker seems cool, though, defending Millie under his breath when shop teacher Mr. Bernardi mocks her in class. Dang, something to add, Booker? Once again, we've got a classic horror movie reference here, because that was a regular Tommy Ross maneuver if I've ever seen one. You suck. Did you say something, Tommy? I said all oh, shucks. <laughs> Mr. Bernardi is played by Alan Ruck, best known as Cameron and Ferris Bueller, but also, gotta plug it whenever I can, great in the Exorcist series on Fox, which was awesome. Here, Ruck is exquisitely vile. Can I just do Speak up. Despite the news of those cold open kills, the school still goes ahead with its homecoming game, the Blissfield Butcher's favorite venue. Millie is their mascot, a big ol' frump-a-dump beaver, and after the game ends and she tells her friends to head home, she's left waiting by her lonesome for her mom to pick her up. Sadly, it's a ride that never comes, cause right now Coral is feeling a little boozy here! Millie's phone dies before she can get a new ride home, and after the stadium lights die too, things start looking like she might be next. Please tell me the butcher, please tell me the butcher, please tell me the butcher. I've got bad news for you, Mill. She runs from him, screaming, and despite his less urgent pace, he's able to catch up and tackle her center field. The butcher becomes unmasked as the moon becomes masked in clouds, and with the power of some, uh, Aztec magic, maybe? The butcher brings Ladola down into Millie. Some fucky magic gives him a matching wound on his body, and then Charlene shows up to scare him off by firing her gun into the air. Those bullets have to come down somewhere, Charlene! The butcher flees, leaving Ladola behind as evidence, police evidence, and Millie is left in a state akin to shock. That is, until night falls and flashy editing and Bear McCreary music take us to midnight. Cut to black! When Millie wakes up in the morning, it ain't Millie no more. It's the Blissfield Butcher, who, while understandably confused at first, quickly comes to accept the situation. Even though this new life ain't half bad, free food, you know? This remade psycho can't break his old habits. He's like Chromopolis Michael. He just loves killing! In the Butcher's Lair, a mill across town, which the production design team had a ton of fun with, nice pinhead reference, Millie wakes up inside the body of the Blissfield Butcher. Where am I? Hello? Oh my god, why do I sound like that? Because you're now played by Vince Vaughn, Millie! <laughs> and it's Friday the 13th. Since the butcher's face is sketched all over local television, Millie quickly finds herself accused as a man of meltdown. A big ol' man of meltdown! I'm a giant! Meanwhile, the butcher modifies his new appearance and marches into school looking like a boss-ass bitch. 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 He ignores Millie's friends and is pulled aside by Ryler, now looking to score sympathy points by associating with the assault survivor. After Ryler mistakes the butcher's behavior as an indication of lesbianism, I'm missing AP bio. I didn't come here to clam jam with you. The butcher puts an end to the little lady by sticking her inside a cryo chamber. A funny detail for this rich, sports-obsessed school to 
have. When Millie gets to the school later, not knowing where else to go in her new body, she comes across the cryo chamber and finds Ryler frozen solid as Frostilicus. But maybe she's made of liquid metal like the T-1000, oh nope, she did, real dead. The butcher is roped into Woodshop where he gets yelled at by Bernardi and his handlebar mustache. If only you would spend a little less time flirting and a little more time learning, you might actually make something out of yourself. That kind of assholery is why the butcher pays Bernardi a visit after school while he's resentfully grading assignments. What kind of a name is that? Stupid name. The butcher's spirit is as sadistic as ever, and even though he doesn't have the same physical strength, you just can't stop a butcher from butchering. A sneaky screwdriver turns the tides in his favor, and that gushing neck blood is only the appetizer for this gourmet kill, which is coming right up courtesy of a table saw. The butcher slides Bernardi into the saw head first, splitting the man in half vertically in full gory graphic detail. Bravo, freaky, bravo. The wonderful kills in Freaky were done by Kill Count veteran Tony Gardner, whose work I most recently covered in Zombieland Double Tap. He made a complete double of Alan Ruck to be split apart like a zipper, and the result was just as messy on set as it looked like in the movie. This room had 50-foot high ceilings. There was still blood on the ceiling when we were done. Gardner's been working since 1983, when he was 18 and appeared as a zombie in Michael Jackson's Thriller. It's great to see him still enjoying the world of horror to this day. Elsewhere in the school, Millie tries meeting up with Nyla and Josh. It kicks off a comedy chase scene in which new anatomy lessons are learned. I got both. Food is tossed. Really? And lines for the trailer are screamed. You're black! I'm gay! We are so dead! Millie, in possession of a new scary kind of strength, eventually stops them and proves who she is by dancing around like a bucktooth big booty beaver. Throw in a secret friend handshake and we've got ourselves a team up. Newton and Vaughn first met during rehearsals for the Blissfield Beaver Dance. She was a faster study than I was on this one. Catherine got it down a little sooner than I did. The two of them collaborated on both characters they'd be playing, swapping ideas about backstory and physical traits to share, like Millie's thumb biting and hair fidgeting. Seems like they had a good time. And Catherine Newton confirmed that making this movie was a blast when I interviewed her on What's Your Favorite Scary Movie last year. While Fi slapping her new plumbing around, Millie catches her friends up on all the plot stuff that happened. Lots of funny jokes here, courtesy of Vince Vaughn, who improvised a bunch of these lines. You guys gotta see this, this is like a floppy anteater. As much as I love Vince Vaughn's performance here, I do see the complaint that he's kind of acting like a generic teenage girl, rather than Millie specifically, as we saw performed by Catherine Newton earlier in the film. They discover that the dagger she was stabbed with is Ladola, and with the help of a Spanish teacher, learn that it's a plus one magic item with an effect on critical fails. If the sacrifice is not successful, the souls of the two persons are swapped, and they change because becomes permanente after 24 hours. That means Millie needs to stab the butcher with Ladola before midnight, or else she'll be stuck in this new body, this new six foot five menacing body. How's that feel? You like being scared? Sure, it might be great for getting revenge against bullies who woof at you. <laughs> but it's also like 30 years older than what you're used to. At the very least, that means way more waking up to pee at night. Trust me on that one. It's gonna be difficult to get a stabbing in before midnight, what with Ladola at the police station and the butcher in a body that lets him avoid any suspicion from law enforcement. When they finally run into each other, What am I wearing? The butcher discovers his new body's strengths and is able to sick the police on Millie and her friends. Their chaotic escape gets them chased by Charlene, so they duck into a shopping mall parking lot and hide amidst the commerce. Nyla and Josh stick Millie in a dressing room as they look for a disguise, and wouldn't you gosh darn know it, this is where Millie's mom Coral works. The two of them get into a conversation that turns pretty personal pretty fast, with Coral bringing up her late husband because it's clearly the only thing she thinks about anymore. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to share all that with you, I just, you're just, you're trying to buy a polo for God's sake. No, 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 no. No, it's okay. Millie's new anonymous voice gives her the chance to speak freely, so they have an honest mother-daughter dialogue, which was also a highlight of Happy Death Day to You. It's a tender moment that Coral tries to parlay into a possible date, but that awkwardness gets interrupted when Charlene shows up and grabs her mom to go find Millie. Gonna be hard to find her when she's got this pro disguise on. 
the face of Aaron Rodgers, or possibly a handsomer me. Now able to move discreetly, Millie and her friends head to a local mini golf place, where the Blissfield High students have gathered since their homecoming dance was cancelled. Unfortunately, assholes like footballer Brett don't need no dance to sexually harass people. Your touch makes this pussy drier than sandpaper, you fucking monkey. Hmm. I can't wait to kill you. You know, the butcher is a scary motherfucker, but damned if he hasn't been going after people who have earned a good murder. Millie and co arrive and see on some monitors that the butcher is stalking Booker through this place's kick ass mini golf course. Again, love the fun setting here, even with all the bastard skellies around. Big shout out to production designer Hilary Andahar and set decorator Tim Pope for these colorful props and black lights. They make my eyes happy. Before the butcher can stab Booker in the back, Millie finds them and knocks out the killer with a golf club. Since Booker would likely tell the cops about their whereabouts, Millie's forced to use her Vince Vaughn mask and knock that teenager hard to the ground. They tie up the butcher at Josh's house, and after Booker comes to, Millie has to explain herself again. This time with the butcher pleading a false case right beside her. Booker, help! Booker! Will you shut up? <laughs> Booker, of course, doesn't buy the body swap story until Millie recites a poem that she wrote and secretly put in his locker a few weeks ago. Oh, also, kinda helps that the butcher drops the whole act. <laughs> you sad fucking cunt. <gasps> we do not say that word here! This is America, mister, not the Outback! With less than five hours until midnight, the others volunteer Josh to watch over their captive killer as they head to the police station. Nyla tries to distract Charlene by telling her she saw the butcher outside, but as she's stealing Ladola from the evidence locker, Charlene returns and friggin' points a gun at her sister's friend? Charlene, chill out! God! In the car, Millie and Booker have probably the best scene of the movie, as Millie finally finds the courage to speak truthfully to the boy she likes. She admits the butcher's body has offered a nice change of pace from always getting picked on. You know, it, it, it does feel kinda good to just feel strong for once. But Booker tells her she's got a strong brain and a strong heart, which are objectively the most important muscles in your body. He asks if he can join her in the back seat of the car, where he tells her that he loved her poem and that he's always liked her. How weird is it that I kinda feel like kissing you right now? Maybe a little, given the whole body swap thing, but Booker likes Millie, so Booker kisses Millie. Until she puts it on hold, wanting their first kiss to involve a little less 5 o'clock shadow. Christopher Landon and co-writer Michael Kennedy both grew up closeted, having to hide their sexuality from friends and family. Obviously, not an easy thing to do. I remember having these feelings of like, well fuck, if I could just be a girl, my life would be easy. Like, I could just openly like the guys that I like, and it wouldn't be an issue. With Freaky, they were thankfully able to write a movie that reflects some of the progress society's made the past few decades. For instance, Joshua's an out-and-proud character played by non-binary actor Misha Osharovich. And although jokes are made regarding the character's sexuality, it's not the end-all be-all of who he is as a person. And of course, with a plot about people and bodies that don't match who they are, Freaky finds a fun and funny way to tackle themes like gender identity. It's a wonderfully modern movie that doesn't feel like it's trying too hard. At Josh's house, his mom comes home from work early, and she doesn't buy his panic excuse of sexual experimentation. I'm straight. <laughs> Joshua, you are many things, but straight isn't one of them. The butcher takes advantage of the confusion and chases after them with a knife, temporarily trapping them with a solid Shining reference. Oh, and they going all in on the reference too. I see you aping that freezer shot. The butcher goes to the police station, and when Millie sees him arrive, she follows him inside, spurring Charlene to shoot at this unarmed suspect multiple times inside the station. Could we get a body cam on this lady, please? Char then pulls another inept move by sticking her gun right up against Millie's back, and that allows her sister to use the butcher's strength to hoist Charlene into the jail cell. See how she likes it. The butcher steals a cop car, nearly running over Josh after he gets to the station, and the regrouped protagonists follow him to the mill, where someone has set up a crazy bump and dance party, even though this whole thing was suggested by the butcher no more than a few hours ago. Did he hang up all those lights himself and clean up the creepy mannequin? At the party, the butcher runs into Brett, who flexes his alpha in an act of sexual insecurity. And I've never made anyone's 
twisting your eye. He leads the butcher away to a more private part of the mill, where his friends Tobin and Squee are waiting. Their names, along with Brett's, are reference to the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing of 2018. Right as they begin to threaten a gang rape, Jesus, the butcher takes a bottle and kills the two friends, slitting Squee's throat open with a glass shard, and seen in a later shot, decapitating Tobin off screen. The decapitation will be done with this conveniently placed chainsaw, which the butcher uses to kill Brett by sawing between his legs off screen. Ouch. That carnage is also shown later, in the same shot revealing Tobin's headless state. Millie and her friends get to the dance, and like all good slasher characters, split up to find the butcher. Josh is led astray by another football player named Phil, who's been a douche this whole movie, but who's now using alcohol as an excuse to experiment. When Josh rejects him, Phil responds with a homophobic slur, ensuring his immediate and justified death. You tell anybody, I'll fucking kill you. The Butcher gets a Phil kill with a hook stab through the eye, which I think might be a gorier reference to when Jason killed Maddie in Friday 7, The New Blood. With the Butcher and Millie face to face once again, it's time for our final showdown. I want my body back. Come and get it. It'd be a real shame if some poorly trained cop showed up and interrupted this climactic- Oh, come on, people! Do we have a precinct-wide problem here? The police stop Millie from stabbing the butcher with Ladola, so another chase ensues, during which Millie suffers from the butcher's lack of cardiovascular upkeep. With some serious help, courtesy of Nyla and Josh, they get the butcher to the ground just in the nick of time. Right before midnight strikes, Millie stabs the butcher, and the spell reverses itself the same way it initially took Hold, through wild editing and Chucky clouds. Millie quickly proves who she is to her friends right as the cops arrive. Shoot that motherfucker! Come on, the cops don't- Okay, never mind. I guess they do take orders from civilian teenagers. Yo, we need to get the AG up in this bitch. This town's PD is fucked. With the day saved, Millie finally kisses Booker using her own lips. Ladola is taken into evidence once again, but with Blissfield's public service department, might as well toss that thing in a river. I mean, even its EMTs are incompetent. They don't notice that the life monitor's flatline is being caused by a lack of connection. Millie returns home, where she snuggles with her mom, and exchanges I love yous with her sister. It's a sweet tucky bedtime. One that could only be ruined if a serial killer happened to find his way into their home. Oh, shit. The butcher grabs Millie and isn't phased when her sister shows up. Uh, don't point a gun at your face to see if it's unloaded. Sharp, please. Mama Kessler gets involved and the whole family fights the killer. But they're at a disadvantage now that Millie's not piloting the mecha butcher. I understand why you feel so weak. Good thing she remembers what his physical weaknesses are, and after the family overpowers him again, Millie ends it all by stabbing the butcher through the back with a broken chair leg. Oh, then she kicks it completely through him. Looks like somebody picked up a thing or two in the butcher's body, and that's the way the movie ends. How many people got killed in bodies they weren't able to swap out of? Let's find out, and oh god, it's the podcast psychopath! Oh! All right, uh, I guess we're doing the numbers like this. 11 people died in Freaky, consisting of three women and eight men, half of whom were football players, making this a pigskin pack. With a runtime of 102 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 9.27 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Mr. Bernardi, which might just be in my top 10 kills of all time. Me, James A. Janice. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Squee, I guess. It's still bloody, but maybe the least unique of all this movie's kills. This set needs more Leatherface. Oh, hi. Ah! Oh. Oh. All right. Back to normal. Miss the boobs. And that's it. Freaky came out in 2020 and was originally going to be called Freaky Friday the 13th. Then Disney sent a cease and desist letter. Next week is fucking Tammy and the T-Rex. You heard me right. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count on Freaky. I want to thank some patrons like Nathan Walker, Jonathan Vuong, and Brayley. And I want to thank Chelsea for helping me with the To The Numbers bit. And for doing the number. She did so good. I'll have another Kill Count trailer for you tomorrow, showing you what to expect for Tammy and the T-Rex. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.